When I played junior varsity high school football, I didn't fit in. Literally, I didn't fit in the stuff I was wearing. The day they handed out the pads, they gave me a helmet. First one was seemingly designed for a small child, and the second one made me understand the vice scene in Goodfellas way too well. <laughs> By the time they gave me a third one, the coaches must have realized that I was a third string lineman who hit the wrong person during half the plays. I wasn't gonna get much time on the field, and nobody cared about CTE in 2002, so they gave me the biggest helmet they had. It must have been plus size. I looked like I was preparing for the lunar landing. <laughs> Sound echoed in there. But I wasn't a complainer. I wasn't one to upset the apple cart. So I stuck an extra knee pad on the crown and considered the problem solved. I was the backup, backup left tackle, and this would be my first and last season as an athlete. With only three games left, soon I could turn in my shockingly clean jersey and ill-fitting protective equipment and resume my rightful place as a quiet, relatively smart, good kid who preferred to be in the stands writing about the game for the school paper. Nobody would miss me. I mean, it's not like I was Daniel. I watched Daniel block another defenseman with ease. The kid didn't stand a chance against Daniel. Coaches loved Daniel. I mean, he was the prize of the program. First string left tackle, standing six foot four. He was lean, strong, and hit the right person when told to. <laughs> he was also my friend, sort of. <laughs> Aside from viral internet cartoons like Strong Bad, Simpsons quotes, and the general commonality of adolescent awkwardness, we didn't have a ton in common. And there was also the church thing. Daniel was very religious, to the point that I had stopped swearing around him. He had invited me to services multiple times, and each and every time, I spun through the mental Rolodex of excuses. The ref's whistle blew, game over. I clapped and cheered, even though I had aided in the victory. Uh, not at all. But hey, now there were just two games left. Do you want to come to church with me on Sunday? Daniel asked in the locker room. He didn't even build up to it this time. Uh, 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 no thanks, man. The Rolodex was failing me. And then I remembered, I have a driving lesson with my dad on Sunday. Okay, he said, pulling on his shirt. Maybe some other time. Yeah, maybe. I had zero plans of there ever being a some other time. Over my lifetime, my family's relationship with religion had gone from the occasional Sunday to some holidays, to maybe on Christmas, to no. <laughs> and around this time, in a post-9-11 United States, when George W. Bush's election and first term had seemingly emboldened the entire Christian right with a renewed sense of purpose, righteousness, judgment, and megachurches, my dad's view on organized religion went from tolerant if dismissive to outright hostile. Another mitigating factor, we lived in the Santa Clarita Valley, a place best known to any Californian as where? <laughs> and then we'd sigh and say, you know, where Six Flags is. And they'll say, oh. <laughs> Santa Clarita is a little red slice of conservatism and family values. Not that I spend a bunch of time thinking about it. Sure, it was hard to ignore the omnipresence of the Mormon church and the ubiquity of Protect Our Troops bumper stickers, and the fact that before every school social function, they papered our hallways with posters banning and warning of the dangers of freak dancing. <laughs> but I had this little piece of paper saying that I had passed the written part of my driving test. Now I just needed to pass the other part, the harder part. And that meant Sundays in an empty, expansive community college parking lot with my dad. In dad's mind, teaching the rules of the road often resulted in hypothetical genocide. <laughs> you just killed another person, he said. His, <laughs> his flat tone at complete odds with the apparent imaginary manslaughter I just committed. I didn't kill anyone. I was too timid to drive any faster than 20 miles per hour, and there was no one else around. 
I snaked the truck up and down the empty concrete lanes of the lot, stopping at imaginary stop signs and practicing left turns and right turns and causing hypothetical mayhem. You just clipped another car. Again, there were no other cars. <laughs> Driving lessons with dad were a weekend tradition. Lessons first and then errands, groceries, dry cleaning, Home Depot, the suburban trinity. All right, that's enough for today, dad said. I parked the truck and killed the engine. You're getting better. Soon we'll go out on the road and you'll be ready before you know it. As we switched seats, he asked, you want Starbucks? Sure, I said. The other god that reigns supreme in Santa Clarita, commerce. The weekend strip mall is the place to be. This parking lot was not the desolate training ground of my automobile tutorial, not with a Ralph's, a Walgreens, a Blockbuster, and a Starbucks. Light glinted off the windshields of every make and model from SUVs to compacts. The sounds of clattering shopping carts and concrete surrounded us. Dad parked and handed me some cash. You get the coffees and I'll... He stopped, his head cocked up and to the right, peering over my shoulder. What? I asked. Dad has a keen eye for certain things, and this look, something, had his attention. Hang on a sec, he said. Before I could ask any more questions, he was gone. Door shut, goodbye. I watched him move through the expanse of minivans and crossovers like a lion stalking through the tall grass. He disappeared behind a Ford station wagon in the distance. Suddenly his bald head popped up again, moving faster, winding in and out like he was ducking tackles, eagerly, failing to suppress a wry smile. Only gone a couple minutes, but here he was, practically giggling. Look what I got, he said. There, in his open palm, lay a cheap piece of plastic. My dad had stolen his first Jesus fish. And he was giddy. I pried it off that Chevy. He said, didn't even damage the paint. Just came loose with one flick. He, he placed it in the change tray. And that's how my dad's newfound hobby began. Over the course of the next few months, I'd occasionally check on his secret stash. It grew, adding smaller holy guppies and even one that had a cross where the eye should be. I didn't know how to feel about Dad's collection, even though I agree that Jesus fish are, frankly, stupid and an empty symbol of faith, I was a rule follower, a proverbial good kid who never talked back to teachers, always apologized at the drop of a hat, and car-based vandalism was a foreign concept. Regardless, I had to admit, I thought it was pretty freaking cool. Here is my middle-aged father staging a secret one-man protest in the heart of a conservative small town. C can I do it? I asked him. Sure, he said. Just don't get caught. <laughs> Thus began a huge crisis of conscience for me, because I started to see Jesus fish everywhere. <laughs> Pickings weren't slim in Santa Clarita. Like the swallows of the Capistrano, these little fender flounders migrated to this city as though JC was getting to reenact the feeding of the 5,000. But every time I scoped one out and made sure the coast was clear and practiced my chisel technique, I wouldn't do it. Who cares what's on a person's car? I knew plenty of Christians, plenty of conservatives, and they were fine. Like Daniel. Sure, he loved President W and was the only 10th grader who would parrot Republican talking points instead of South Park impressions. But he was fine. Sure, he could be annoying with his dogmatic beliefs, but he was also dependable and hardworking, and his football prowess had saved me from ever having to back up his backup. He never really even questioned why I wouldn't go to church. I thought we had a mutual respect for each other's beliefs. When the football season was finally over, I decided to celebrate by staying home. I faked some tenuous at best stomach issues. When Daniel called me and asked to come over after school, I thought nothing of it. But when I let him in and he let off with, is anyone else home? Something was different this time. 
His voice, more hushed and serious than usual, made sure the coast was clear. We sat near each other, alone in the house. I know we're very different people, he began, but I have to tell you something. His tone was unwavering and solemn. Uh, everything okay? I asked. Yes, he said. Is there anyone else in the home? <laughs> he asked again. There wasn't, and suddenly I was all too aware of that fact. <laughs> Just he and I, no witnesses. I tried to shake it off. I know this guy, he's an okay dude, a little weird, but okay. My dry throat managed to croak out an answer. No. Daniel breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, good. I watched his hand disappear into his book bag and my breath caught. I've been spending a lot of time online, he said. Oh, please don't be porn. I really don't want to explain porn to you. I don't even understand it myself. A lot of research, he said. Emerging, he held a red report folder. He handed it to me, and it felt light, maybe five pages max. And the first page was just the word confidential, written that stamped version of clip art. <laughs> Daniel's voice remained hushed, so the house was bugged. I have found proof that God exists. <laughs> what a relief! <laughs> I deflated and sank into the couch. This was just Daniel being Daniel trying to convert his heathen, technically Catholic, friend to the wonders of his church. Daniel, look, I, I'm really not... No, you don't understand, he said, his voice rising. I hear the kids at our school and even teachers talk crap about religion. It's bothered me, but it doesn't anymore, because I found this. He reached over and flipped to the next page of the report. There was a poorly cropped and overly grainy image of a black box nestled on a mountainside. Daniel tapped this image repeatedly. Do you know what that is? This is proof that God exists. That's Noah's Ark. Some explorers found it in the Andes Mountains. I was back to being aware we were the only two people in the house. <laughs> Noah? The animals guy? With the, f with the flood and the boat and everything? Yes, he yelled, it's there in South America and someday I'm going to go see it. Now, granted, this was the early aughts, and maybe Daniel had never heard of Photoshop. <laughs> I spoke slowly, confirmed what I just heard. So you believe that you found proof of God because you saw this picture of Noah's Ark on the internet. He nodded. Well, Daniel, uh, I scrambled the Rolodex of excuses spinning like a game show prize wheel. I think my parents will be home soon, and they don't really like me to have friends over when I'm <coughs> sick. Uh, maybe we can talk more about this later. He took back his research, and I walked him to the door. Before he left, he turned to me. Remember, don't tell anyone. I nodded, and then I promptly told my entire family the second they all got home. The entire bizarre moment was strange, uncomfortable, and downright infuriating. Here was a guy who I thought, despite our differences, we understood each other. Someone who I thought is the opposite of me in nearly every way, but we still respected each other. I thought, like me, he'd see past the belief system and recognize that it wasn't about what church he went to or I didn't go to. We could accept each other. But now I saw there would be no tolerance of those who didn't thump the Bible and hide behind religion. There was no willingness to listen to the other side. If they didn't get me with their aquatic-themed bumper jewelry, their total dominance over an entire school system in town, they'd get me one-on-one, -on -one, look me dead in the eye, and tell me that I am wrong, and they are right, and there's no other way about it. To me, it was their way of saying, you will never be long. Those tiny, gleaming, fake silver car adornments took on new meaning. My dad wasn't just playing a prank. It was defiance in the face of the overwhelming message that said the minority opinion does not matter here. It was the middle finger pushing back against what they thrust in our face. And the next time I was in a crowded parking lot, I saw a Jesus fish. I didn't know if I had the guts to take one yet, but I knew I could no longer be the type of person 
who didn't speak up when the helmet didn't fit. Thank you so much. Rory Kelly, give him a hand.